guests <laughs> coming into my home. <laughs> so, but um, we're going to talk about best um, practices with um, distance learning today. Could you move to the next slide really quick? Well, for this one, yes, you're right, Paige. Sorry, I messed up. Yes, that's we'll okay. That slide. Thank you. Yeah. So busy so, you people, I forgot about our order. Yeah. <laughs> so this is our um, a quote that we have. This is from LWHS Distance Learning Plan. Learning experience teachers design when school is in regular session cannot be replicated through distance learning. Um, I'm really excited and I want you guys to use this as an opportunity to push yourselves forward. Um, we're coming into what our 21st century learning models. And so we're going to have to redesign the classroom. Traditionally, we have been the, de we've delivered content. That's our job. We still need to know the content, but we're also going to be architects. We're redesigning our classroom and we're going to have to be curators. We're curating knowledge for our kids. And so this is going to be a really exciting time. And there's a few things that you need to consider when transitioning, moving to distance learning. Um, the first thing is communication and feedback. It needs to be clear. So directions need to be clear. It needs to be transparent. It needs to be consistent. So set up some office hours for yourself and make sure that you're checking your email at regular, regularly scheduled times so you can support your students and give them that feedback they need. They need to hear from you. Um, it needs to be timely and you need to have active monitor, monitoring. So make sure that you set up office hours, you create a schedule for yourself. Um, I've already started kind of, I wake up eight to 10, I work, take a break, do the same thing and let your students know that. Um, less is more. So slower pacing. Um, your, your students aren't going to be able to do everything that they normally would in a face-to-face -face classroom. So this is where you start going through and looking at your curriculum and finding those essential assignments. So not the enrichment assignments, but the ones that are going to help them hit their standards and then take time to learn new platforms and tools. We are going to show you a lot of platforms today and tools. Don't get overwhelmed. Take one of those platforms that you are interested in, get to know it and work with it. If you're new to video conferencing software, find a friend um, and just video conference each other, get familiar with that platform, get familiar with videoing yourself, doing a traditional lecture just slowly move into this. We're not expecting perfection, just progress, okay? And then one of the most important things is have a classroom community. The same way that you build your culture in your classroom, you need to do that online. So check in on your students' mental well-being. Make time for fun. So I'm going to give you a resource for um, virtual team building um, when I come back to you guys. And then put content um, to the side for a short time to do something together. So you still have that feeling of community, even though we're um, at a distance from each other. All right, okay. thanks Paige. I'm gonna go back to this slide and let um, first Sarah and then Tracy uh, introduce themselves next. And um, we wanted to use this segment of the webinar to let each of these teachers just talk a little bit about um, what what's happening in their districts. We have uh, different types of districts represented here and different grade levels that these teachers work with. And so we just want them to share a little bit stories from from other places. So um, Sarah, let's start with you. Introduce yourself and um, let's talk about what's happening where you are. Sure. Hi, everyone. Um, I am Sarah Dahl. I'm an English teacher at uh, Park High School in Livingston, Montana. Um, I've actually been teaching, I was counting it up in my head, 13 years. Um, this is my 13th year. And um, I'm going to share just a little bit about kind of who I am as a teacher, and then I'll talk about what we're doing in our district. Um, so uh, I, <laughs> you know, I'm 
um, a millennial, it, there's kind of that assumption sometimes that we just know tech, but um, I am definitely one of those late, um, I'm one of those late uh, bloomers in terms of education, which is not necessarily what's expected for millennials. I spent the first um, 10 years uh, kind of shying away from technology in my classroom. And it's only been within the last three years that I've really started integrating a lot of technology. And now I actually feel really confident in myself as a, you know, a go-to technology person in my district. Um, and that kind of, as a late adopter to it, I'm still learning tools that um, I can use. When I first started using technology in my classroom, I, uh, you know, I was very much overwhelmed with all of the things that are out there. And I really became more at ease with technology when I started to just pick one thing, focus on that, become better at it. And then I found that by focusing on that one tool, I actually was able to use the skills that I learned from that tool to apply to so many other tools. And so then I was, I was more comfortable about um, really engaging in a lot more technology. And so um, I am kind of, I, I'm one of a, a team at our, at our high school in Livingston um, that are the go-to people for technology. <laughs> and um, when this, this all kind of came to uh, a head for all of us, I'm sure, my district wasn't exactly in a place to handle it. Um, we are not a Google school. Uh, there are there were a few of us in our district um, as a whole that used uh, technology in our classrooms, but there was nothing that was adopted for our entire school that would um, that would be like the standard go to in order to make distance learning so much easier. We didn't have an infrastructure set up, and so uh, th this team that we have. Uh, in our high school kind of got together and said, hey, you know, what are some of the best ideas? Let's try and help our, ad, um, our administrators out, come up with a plan and implement that, which is what we ended up doing. Um, we were fortunate enough that we are a Microsoft uh, district. We have access to Office 365. And so we basically kind of took, um, kind of, took that, that suite and we taught our uh, students, or, or excuse me, our teachers who became students, um, taught our teachers through Zoom how to um, use Teams. And we started just making some decisions. Okay, everybody's gonna use Teams. This is what we're gonna do. This is how we're going to do it. Um, and it was really amazing how we as educators step up in such a trying time that we're all living in right now. Uh, because I had, you know, teachers of, you know, 30 and 40 years that were coming to me and they're like, I need to make this happen. What can I do? I need your help. And it, so it wasn't, you know, there wasn't that resistance like, um, oh, we're not gonna utilize technology in my classroom. They're, everybody's gonna have to do pencil and paper. They're like, nope, I, I know I need to do this. What do I need to do? And so um, really where I'll be speaking from is, is kind of that um, going from kind of not having much set up to these are some things that you can do um, to get started. Uh, great. Thanks, Sarah. Tracy, will you introduce yourself and talk about what things have been like where you are? <laughs> yes. Can I just say crazy? And that's <laughs> um, my name is Tracy Pilts. I am in Billings, Montana. I have um, uh, like 12 years experience teaching. All of my classroom teaching experience was in kindergarten. Um, now I work for the Billings Public School District as a tech integration specialist. So I work 
mostly with our kindergarten, first and second grade students and teachers. So um, that's who I've been supporting. Um, I have suddenly become one of the most popular people in our district all of a sudden, now that we are all learning how to do distance learning. So it's been um, a really busy couple of weeks. Um, in our district, um, we did make devices available for students to check out. Um, most of our kindergarten through second grade classes use iPads and then third grade and above. Most of them are using Chromebooks. Um, so each of our schools did set up a checkout process where um, families that needed them could oh come to the school and check out devices and take them home with them. So that's been really um, it's so cute. Yeah. <laughs> Turn it more. Um, uh, as far as how our, our teachers are, this one, was slow to, this one was slow to load to me several. Sorry, I think someone needs muted. Several minutes to get in. Click on the volume. Sorry. Um, so anyway, as far as how our teachers are adjusting, um, you know, obviously it's been <laughs> who aren't super um, confident with some of the platforms or um, just hadn't been using them in their classes. But um, I have been amazingly, um, I don't know, just impressed with how teachers are um, just realizing like this is what we need to do for our kids to be able to deliver some content to them. Um, and so they've just really stepped up and, um, you know, are just kind of jumping in feet first and learning these platforms. Um, we're a Google district. And so um, third grade and up, fourth grade and up is um, mostly turning toward Google platforms using a lot of Google Classroom. Um, and then a lot of our K-5 um, classes had already been using Seesaw. We have the paid Seesaw for Schools platform in about 20 of our elementary schools. Um, so those have been kind of the two primary platforms that we're using to connect with families and send work to students. Um, and then utilizing video software like Zoom to be able to have that kind of live interaction with students is what we've been using so far. Um, and I'll share a little bit later in the webinar kind of a little bit more specifically for K2 students, um, some of the tools and um, in the chat, I can answer questions that you might have. All right, thanks, Tracy. Um, so I'm gonna scoot past these here. Now we're gonna have each of our teachers briefly go over some of the tools that they've been using with students and that they've been supporting uh, students or teachers to use. Um, this is gonna be demo slam style real quick. Um, where we won't be able to go into the nuts and bolts of exactly how these tools work, um, but we would I'd be happy to take questions in the chat box about the tools and um, specific functions that they may do. Um, we just want to uh, give you a little bit of taste of some of the different innovative things get, that can be done, um, both simple and a little bit more complex for the, the depending on your your style. So, Sarah, you are up. Well, and then let me just say really quickly, and then we also all have our email addresses at the end, and so. Additionally, if you have additional questions about anything that any of these wonderful ladies talk about, um, we're, you're welcome to reach out and, you know, shoot them an email. I'm sure they can help you. All right, take it away, Sarah. Yeah, so <laughs> I'm going to start. Um, so one of the biggest frustrations for us when we when we looked at like possibly having to close was we are not a Google school. Um, our middle school is a Google school. Um, but we are not set up as a Google school. Um, and so we tackled things from Microsoft. So if you are uh, in the same boat, if you're in the same boat as us and you weren't a, a Google school when you started, um, Microsoft does have some tools that are very similar to what you can do um, as a Google school. And so I just wanted to kind of point out um, the four that I feel I probably use the most um, as uh, in terms of um, digital learning. So the very first one is Teams. That's the, the T with the little people. That's like a Google Classroom. That is a classroom, um, a learning management system that you can use. It allows you to 
communicate with students via post. You can create a, a feed um, that you um, post things on regularly. It also allows you to chat individually with students. Um, it also allows you to, if you have numbers, you can call them through, uh, through your team so that you're not necessarily on your, your home phone. Um, the chat function is really nice. You can video chat or you can just, you know, have a typing conversation with them. Um, and so the communication piece is really great with this. Um, and therefore the collaboration piece um, kind of goes with it uh, because you are able to share through um, OneDrive, uh, Word documents, Excel documents, all of those types of things. You can have some collaboration um, through Teams and Teams will ease that for you. Uh, and of course it does have the standard, you are able to um, have them turn in assignments. It has a place where when you turn in assignments, you can create a rubric and you can grade your assignments through a rubric that you establish um, through the, the um, assignment part of Teams. It also links up with, if you want to create a quiz, you can link up with Google Forms, which is the icon that's below that kind of bluish one. Um, the F, that is Google Forms, or excuse me, that's Microsoft Forms. Um, it acts like Google Forms. <laughs> um, I actually, I, I've used both. Um, I myself am more familiar with Microsoft and I like a lot of the functionality of Microsoft Forms. Um, and it can link directly to Teams so you can create it as a quiz and as an assignment um, by pulling from uh, that particular app. It allows you to do multiple choice questions, essay questions, ranking questions, um, Likert questions, like a, you know, a, a scale um, type thing. And it, um, it's really a simple app and it's, it's easy to use. Um, and then the, the purple one off to your right is OneNote. Um, OneNote acts like a digital notebook. It has tabs and pages. Um, you can organize things. I've used this really nicely with lit circles. Um, and it's a place where kids can take notes and you can see them as they're, as they're taking those notes. It is a place where you can upload articles and they even have extensions for Google Chrome where you can clip articles directly from uh, Google Chrome into uh, notebooks, uh, into the, the OneNote notebook. Um, and it allows you to uh, like load all of your students into that notebook. You can use it in isolation or um, Teams even has a section um, every like say team or classroom that you set up in, in Microsoft Teams allows you to also have a notebook that goes with it that you can um, have the students work out of. And then the last one is OneDrive and that's just your, your cloud storage. Um, just like you would have Google Drive, OneDrive is the one, you know, the one place that you can hold all your digital files and then it leaks really nicely uh, to Teams. Each of these icons, um, every icon on a slide has a link to either a YouTube tutorial on how to use it or what it does or an article that um, kind of explains its usefulness. And so you can click on any of those icons and it'll take you to, um, to something that might be helpful in terms of explaining more than what I've just done. Um, the, next, the next one that I wanna talk about, this one's, um, I'm gonna spend a little bit of time on this, um, probably more so than the other ones, but it's HyperDocs. Um, in the survey, people had mentioned that they're looking for interactive lessons or things that they can do, or you're not really sure how to set up your planning. Um, so a HyperDoc, you can kind of see the icon up at the top is HyperDocs and that is going to take you to, that is linked to a website that is a, that has some templates for HyperDocs. Um, what I have to the right here, uh, I wasn't able to get this one, um, this one linked uh, just yet, but I, I will try and get that linked when we get off this. Um, that is a Chemistry, I, I teach with a colleague who is wonderful, wonderful about integrating technology into um, her science classes. And what she has created here is the first, um, the first week of assignments that her chemistry class is going to be doing. And so what you see on the right in that document, she actually, because we are a Microsoft school, created this document in, um, in Word. 
um, a lot of the templates are going to show you how to use Google Docs for your HyperDoc. Um, but because we are using Microsoft, she wanted to see if she could do it in Word. Um, she built these tables. Uh, each of the icons on the side, the little pictures on the side, a link to something that she wants her kids to do. So basically what a hyperdoc is, is it's a document where you add links um, to images or to words, and that will take you to whatever it is linked to. In her case, she has it linked to PDFs, she has it linked to videos, she has different things um, linked to websites. And on the one side, it explains what the student will be doing. And on the other, it's how to access those types of assignments. So for her, this was a nice way for her to organize a whole week's worth of learning for her student. Um, and uh, she organized it. The HyperDocs link will tell you all sorts of different uh, ways to, to organize your pieces. But um, you can look at, first, how are you engaging them? Second, how might you be exploring, like how might they be? Um, there's also, um, you can add in there something that you might want to explain or something that you want them to apply the, the knowledge to, and then a share out portion. Um, I really liked what she did and I wanted you to see that because it can be very simple. Um, I am, terrible at making things so much harder than they need to be. Um, and so I, I liked how she was like, she had this very simple Word document. She created it in a PDA, PDF and all of her links still worked. So you can turn this into a PDF and kids can still link by clicking on the different icons, pictures or words um, for what to do. On the left, however, is my more complicated version. <laughs> Um, I, it's not necessarily a document, but I took that same kind of idea. I wanted to engage kids at a point. I wanted to explain something. I wanted them to explore something. And so I, um, I'm doing, uh, just a really short week kind of unit on six word memoirs, um, based off of Hemingway. And, um, we'd been working on Hemingway before we left. And so I was like, okay, how do I, continue with this aside from just having them read short stories and answer questions. I wanted them to interact a little bit more. So I created an Adobe Spark page. And when you um, click on that Adobe St Spark page, Nikki, do you mind clicking on it really quick? Um, this is the Spark page that I uh, created. Now, if you know Spark, then you know how to do this. If you don't know Spark, it is a free tool that Adobe puts out there. And this is kind of what it does. And um, you are able to embed pictures, and then you're able to create buttons, you're able to link things. Um, I have these buttons where it links to the Six Word Memoir website. Um, it'll link to uh, a video that explains Six Word Memoirs. I explain kind of how the legend goes with Ernest Hemingway. And then I actually apply it. Um, I'm having the apply and share kind of at the same time where they create six word memoirs and then they share it in teams um, by posting a six word memoir that they might create or that they um, might write about themselves and a character. And then I show them how to do that. And then the last part of it is them reflecting on what they did and they'll, they'll write a piece that kind of answers these questions. So HyperDocs is a nice way to take, okay, I have these things that I wanna do. This is how they are connected um, and it's a whole week worth of assignments. So this was the one I was kind of most excited about putting in there and I decided to put that one in kind of late. Um, the next one is Padlet. Uh, Padlet is like, I, um, it was explained to me first as it being like a bulletin board, but I found when I got in there and I explained that there is a lot more to it. Um, the Padlet link at the top, the little icon at the top of the page to the left is going to take you to kind of a video on how you can use Padlet. Um, what I have here is a picture um, of a Padlet that we use in our technology group. Um, Nikki and I actually host a technology group where we work with teachers on um, integrating technology into what they're doing in their classroom and kind of help them build some leadership skills and, you know, some confidence in using technology. Um, it's a great program that we actually um, got from Tracy, uh, who does it in Billings. 
Um, and so uh, Padlet is a way for um, those people that are in that group to share out what they've explored um, because they can create posts on it and each post can scroll. Um, I, I didn't know how to um, make it scroll, so this is just a picture. Um, but Padlet's really fun way to get students to respond to you. Um, whether you set up uh, a video in the Padlet that they watch and then they comment off of the video, or you embed a picture, or you want them to have a cl class discussion, Padlet's nice that way. Um, on the next slide, I show you just some different pictures of ways that you can organize things on there. Um, what it looks like to post down in the bottom right when you click add in there. That's what it looks like. You can link, you can go to the web, you can add in a picture, you can upload something. Um, on the left there, that's how you start Padlet. Uh, this, whether you want to stream things in one big stream, you want to create a wall, it gives you various different options. Some of the newer ones like the map and the timeline at the bottom there, um, those are ways to organize um, you know, for particular subject matters or particular topics, which is also kind of nice. Um, and it's, it's really easy for kids to uh, collaborate this way. Uh, the last one that I am going to actually talk about, this is kind of from an English um, person, <laughs> English person standpoint, but you can use this, um, you can use this in a variety of ways. Uh, our history teacher, um, I actually helped her uh, with this one last year and she uses it for students to create brochures, but it's called Book Creator. And again, the icon up in the left is um, a direct link to the Book Creator uh, website because Book Creator does a wonderful job of explaining how to use them. Um, and so it's directly linked to that website. They are currently offering the paid version for three months. So they are extending the use on this. Um, you can use this for free, but you wouldn't, uh, there wasn't like collaboration wasn't possible unless you paid for it. Um, but now because they're offering that paid version, um, that three months uh, free, um, they're opening it up, you can do a lot more things. What I love about Book Creator is like what you see here is a, a comic book kind of splayed out. Um, it, is a, it is basically you publish, um, you create a story and you publish like it is an ebook. It looks really fun, really nice when you get into it. Um, this is a, a, a book, a comic book that I created as an example for my students who are going to create children's books based on dinosaurs. Um, and they were they played with it they they have a lot of fun with it but it is a way for them to just um a, a way for them to publish what they um have created stories um brochures whatever it is it, it's uh it allows you to embed videos it allows you to include links um you can create your own um, you can pull in images, you can pull in your own images. So if kids have their own images that they want to use, um, it allows you to do that as well. Um, and then when you share it as a link, it, it will open up like it is a real book. So it's really cute that way. I think on the next page, oh no, this is, yeah, I think that's it. That's all I have. <laughs> All right, thank you, Sarah. So you guys, um, in the chat box, I'm gonna drop in my first resource. Um, so if you wanna go ahead and go to that slide. So this is Wakelet. And like I said, we are becoming curators of knowledge as well. And I love Wakelet. Um, this is one for this um, webinar that we're doing. And I'm going to add a lot of the resources. I've been recording them that are coming in the chat box. So you guys have that all for you. And so this is a great place for you to curate resources for your students and share that with them. Um, so they can use those resources for projects, assignments, whatever you need to do. Um, can you move to the next one, please? I'm moving quickly here, so <laughs> everyone gets a chance to speak. The next one is City Hunt. And what I was looking for here is just team building things that you can do virtually online. So if you scroll down to the bottom of the uh, link that we give you in the Wakelet, 
um, it will give you a bunch of team building activities that you can do virtually. So for example, um, do like a photo scavenger hunt with your kids. These are just ways to build community in your classroom and make sure that everybody feels included, safe, those types of things, okay? Um, the next one, I'm going to show you is quizzes. So some of you might be familiar with it, others of you might not. Um, this is my preferred um, uh, formative assessment tool and summative assessment tool. The reason why I like it is it can be student paced or it can be live. Um, you can use it as practice. It plays on any device and then there's thousands of public quizzes that are already available for you to use. And then what I added for you, you could use this as a summative assessment, but what I really like using it for is a formative assessment and it's from Edu Protocols, which I've added to the Wakelet as well. And it's called the Fast and the Curious. So it's a good formative assessment for your kids. It's fun. I gave you the link right there to show you how to play the Fast and the Curious with your kids. Um, it reduces cognitive load. And so they're, they're getting the practice that they need. And they're going through and it's letting you check to make sure that they're understanding the material before they're able to move on. Paige, did and you create that or was it all, did you find it on Quizlet? So this is from Edu Protocols. So um, when I went to ISTE, um, I got to go to one of their um, breakout sessions that they did and we did this learning Polish. And it was amazing how much Polish I was able to pick up by playing the fast and the curious with no exposure to it before. So, um, and then I think Matt Miller ditched that textbook. He has that on um, his website as well. And so that gives you an instruct instructions on how to play fast and the curious. So kind of a fun way. And then um, the last one that I wanna show you guys is Sutori. So it was previously called History. Um, I think Sutori is genius. First of all, you can use it as um, it's a collaborative tool. So you can use it as an instructional tool for the classroom. So if you don't have a learning management system, you could actually create a timeline for your class using this. And it gives you, um, you can curate written audio visual resources for your student. You can create quizzes as well. And then in the paid version, if you guys want to do that, um, you can hold forum um, discussions. So I gave you, um, oh, wait, hold on. Sorry. Um, I, I'm going to give you guys a link right here. And this is how to set up uh, Sutori for your classroom if you're teaching a lesson using that um, and importing resources. And then I have my students use Sutori for presentations as well. So they can create their own timelines, presentations, and then they can share those with their fellow classmates. And you can put it in presentation form. Um, you can keep it as a timeline. So it's good stuff. All right. That's all I have, you guys. Okay. <laughs> all right. So um, I'll share some of the tools that our K2 teachers are um, utilizing the most right now. If you want. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'd mentioned this earlier, but um, the platform that I would say most of our K2, maybe K3 teachers are utilizing is Seesaw. Um, this is a digital portfolio tool. Um, what I really love about it is that um, when the kids were in the classroom, parents were connected to Seesaw. So this was a huge family communication platform. Um, there's messaging in here, kind of similar to Remind. Kids are posting work here. Um, so before we were doing distance learning, we had so many parents already connected to this, um, that this has continued to be a really fantastic communication tool with our parents. Um, I sent out um, just kind of a, a little text to a, a group of teachers that I work with, K2 teachers, just sort of asking um, 
you know, kind of what are your top tips right now? And I, I think every single one of them wrote back and said that staying in touch with families, um, daily kind of checking in with your kids through, you know, a quick photo or video or something is so key. Um, and Seesaw is just such a perfect tool to do this. So um, on the first Seesaw slide, there's a link to their remote learning page that has resources for teachers and um, families as well. Um, and then the thing that says Tracy's Seesaw tips, I've started making, um, I think, about a billion videos a day. Um, just really quick how-to videos as things are coming up. So I'm going to continue adding to that um, little flip grid in there with lots of videos. Um, and then that little, uh, I don't know, GIF that you're watching shows the activities in Seesaw. And I think that's another reason teachers are really loving this right now is um, there's this huge platform already created with free activities that um, teachers can be accessing, um, you know, search for your grade level, standard skill, and they're ready to go send them out. Um, so that's been really huge. Um, the next slide is more Seesaw. Um, I really loved this. Chris Shiner, who um, I put his Twitter handle on there, like starting so simple, trying not to make things overly complex. And I thought his graphic that he made was so useful. Um, <laughs> use the microphone, use the camera. <laughs> um, to, and then just some really quick, easy tips for how you can make simple assignments for your kids um, that they could do really easily at home. And then those other slides are uh, pictures on there. Um, are just a couple that I found. Um, one is a teacher here in Billings. One is a teacher um, that I connected with on Twitter. And that's just kind of how they're setting up their weekly or daily routines and involving Seesaw in those routines. Um, something I thought was really powerful that a lot of those teachers wrote back to me too is you can have low tech or no tech activities. Kids can be, you know, writing sight words in chalk out on the sidewalk and then have them, you know, open up their Seesaw app and take a picture of that and add that into their journal. So it's a really nice way of incorporating some hands on no tech things, but still sort of keeping them accountable so that they can be adding those things into their journal. And that's what's built into some of those um, daily schedules. The next um, slide, I think, um, so another tool I really love is Flipgrid. Um, what I like about Flipgrid right now, because for privacy reasons, um, the way Seesaw is set up at home is that kids can't see each other's stuff. Um, parents can never see anyone but their own kids. Um, things in Seesaw. Right now, when they're at home, they can only see their own things. They can't see their classmates things. So for privacy, that's awesome. But for you see my little daughter sneaking in every now and then. Um, for kids like that, there are some times when they really miss seeing their friends and seeing some of their work. Um, so Flipgrid is a nice option for this. It's video. You can upload video, take video right in here. Um, it can be shared out so they can see each other's, but it's still private. Like they would need to log in or use a passcode so not just anyone could get in. Um, but this right now I think is a nice option for sending out a topic and having them all respond. Um, the next thing I put on here, I tried to highlight, especially for our young learners, uh, again, some of those really hands-on things. So there's a couple documents made by curriculum coaches in our district specific to K2. There's a lot of hands-on literacy ideas and then math ideas. And again, um, the things that you do, then I would have the kids take a quick picture of, upload it into Seesaw, use the microphone in Seesaw and explain, you know, the math problem you did or what was the thinking behind that. Um, if you wrote your sight words in chalk out on the sidewalk, now you can read your sight words to me so that I know you actually know the words that you're writing. Um, so a lot of good hands-on tactile things that could be combined um, with something like Seesaw or Flipgrid. Um, and then I think uh, my last slide, um, I 
like I mentioned, our district has iPads with mostly um, for our K2 students. So we work a lot with apps. Um, and in talking with teachers and families, that's what a lot of our younger kids are on at home is they have access to an iPad or some kind of tablet at home. Hey. So these are some of my favorite um, apps. All of these are Street. free okay. for learning at I home. Uh, I'm going an easy ride with lots of space. <laughs> all of the different apps on That's there. Fun. So when you have this slide, oh, yeah. like you want to climbing, right? um, But I included a it's couple fine, of apps short. that are oh. um, story apps. So That's Epic and Rivet are just okay. Um, the Math Learning Center, the one kind of on the top right, is a ton of like virtual manipulative types of things. So um, telling your kids to use that, they have access to all of these manipulatives at home that maybe they didn't take home with them, like 10 frames and geo boards and that kind of thing. Um, there's a PBS Games app um, that has tons of things your kids can do. The PBS Kids Scratch Junior, um, and then Draw and Tell would just be like a nice um, creative tool where kids can be telling stories, drawing, using stickers, making videos. So these are just a few of my very favorite free, like would be simple to implement and use at home for families. And then that bit.ly down there at the bottom is just um, for a, a newsletter I send out every Monday. Um, it usually has four tips on every newsletter, either highlighting an app or a tech tool or an idea. Um, so if that's something you'd be interested in, you can see the archive there and then I'll continue to post more ideas um, at that bit.ly. Awesome. Thank you so much. Um, and for those of you who are primary teachers, Tracy is an awesome research resource um, for all of your, your littles technology with littles. Um, and so I, I highly encourage you to check out her blog as well. So this, this next part of the program, Carrie and I are going to talk a little bit about Montana PBS and Idaho P PBS um, and some of the things that PBS has to offer you for your distance learning planning. Um, this website is a free resource for teachers. It's called pbslearningmedia.org. Uh, this website is a collaboration between PBS stations all over the country, and it features videos, games, images, lesson plans, interactive lessons um, for children in pre-K through 12. Um, again, it is free and there are collections on PBS resources, um, PBS programming, some of our favorite things on this website. And so I, I would, oh, I'm getting ahead of myself. I would highly encourage you to check out this resource. Um, both our PBS stations, Idaho and Montana, are going to be hosting um, quick webinars about how to use this website and to, to use it to plan for your distance learning lessons. In Montana, we have adopted a couple of things to support our teachers. Um, the first is the Learn at Home program schedule, which will be launching on Monday. We have revised our normal broadcast programming schedule on television um, Monday through fi Friday, starting at 630, um, to have different blocks of uh, programming available for pre-K through eighth grade. And our idea on this is that we would hope that um, teachers could use this programming schedule to reach our students that may not have the access to internet or may not have devices at home, um, but do receive our broadcast signal and that this these programs would be something they could watch and hopefully interact and discuss with their families. And then we do have links to digital resources with things that um, are aligned to the programming. We've also created a website, a distance learning website, uh, with all of our resources that we're curating across the PBS system, as well as things we're creating in Montana. And that is the link there. And then because we know that you probably have really specific questions um, about what you, you and your students are facing, we are available to you in a closed Facebook group. Um, we're always sharing resources there as well. So if you go to Facebook and search for MT PBS teachers, uh, we will add you to that group. You don't have to be from Montana to be in our group. Um, we have teachers from all over in that group. Uh, we're also on Twitter. Um, 
I, I host a, I co-moderate a chat for teachers on Tuesday evenings at 8 p.m. called Montana Ed Chat. And we'd love to have you join us and engage in Twitter conversation about Montana, about the topics that are interested, interesting to you. And then starting next week, Carrie and I are going to be hosting office hours via Zoom for teachers who might want to talk about specific questions that you have about working with students. I'm going to hand it over to Carrie um, to talk about some of the Idaho specific resources. Although I will say these resources, Montana resources are available to everybody um, as are Idaho resources as well. Correct. Thank you so much, Nikki. Um, so the, the first, um, really the resource, and if you click on this, if you have the slide deck and you click on the picture, it'll take you to this page. But um, <clears throat> Idaho has a, excuse me, a local production called Science Trek. Um, it's geared at about second through sixth graders. And each of those little click on a topic things drop down and have more topics. There's over a hundred um, topics on the website and all of them have links. Um, to they all have a short quick little science video um, that's you know anywhere from three to five minutes sometimes a little bit more but they also have some of them have full length videos that are like 28 minutes um, and then they all are linked to the idaho content standards for science but also if they link to like math or reading standards we link those to um, the standards from second to sixth grade so every video is linked to standards and every video has additional teaching resources that goes with it. So this is a really great resource for at home, even during the school year, but um, especially now to find kind of ready made things. And I'll tell you that as somebody who has personally like scoured standards and gone through this website, I'm pretty sure we cover um, almost everything in the second through sixth grade standards. That was one of the first projects I was tasked with um when i came on board was what else do we need on our science trek website and she um the lady who does that is very responsive to um you know wanting to know what everybody wants and so if there's something missing that you would love to have shoot me an email and let me know because she really tries hard she's also venturing into the 360 world so there's some cool um virtual videos and 360 videos as well so check out science trek um do you want to go back to the thank you um, and then, of course, oh, my computer just fell, don't mind me. Of course, we have similar things to what Nikki shared. Um, we also have a distance learning website, and um, some of that is, um, the link is there to our website, and so we've curated that with collections that we think are great. PBS has made a really great distance learning collection on learning media as well, so um, we have that. We're not quite as advanced as Montana PBS yet, but we are also working on adjusting our broadcast schedule. We really realize that there are a lot of students that don't have the internet and they may not have internet access. And we know teachers are worried about how do those kids, um, how do we connect with those kids? So we're also working on adjusting our broadcast schedule. We already have the 24 seven PBS kids channel, which plays pre-K to second grade content. Um, and then we're, we're adjusting um, a channel to uh, channel 4.3 if you're in Idaho. We'll, um, starting at noon Pacific, one mountain time, um, we'll be playing content for fourth through 12th grades. I'm working right now with production on seeing if we can get that organized. They just wanted to throw it all in, they're producers, not teachers. And I wanna do like, you know, fourth through eighth is, is first, is a one to four and you know whatever so we're working with that back and forth so just keep in mind that, but that has started it right now um we're adjusting that as well and i just had conversations yesterday with our director of content about possibly letting teachers um create lessons and like video teaching a lesson and and um putting that on our broadcast stations as well so we are working on figuring that out. So if any of you are interested in doing that and being on Idaho Public Television, um, feel free to send me an email, but we really are trying to figure out how to reach people who, those kids who um, we know don't have internet access. Um, and then we're, wait, I wasn't done, go back. I'm almost done, sorry, I'll hurry. That was Nikki's like, move on, Carrie. That was her hint, I got it. Okay, I'll be fast. <laughs> um, we're also doing, 
Nikki already talked about the office hours, which I'll be a part of, and we'll also have a colleague on there who's a high school teacher. So we will cover the, the gamut from K to 12th grade for you during those office hours, and you're welcome to just pop in. But also we're doing, my colleague Sam is doing virtual story times um, with kids. And I know that that's happening in a lot of places, but she's doing that on YouTube. She's doing a K2 and a 3-5 um, daily. So she'll do twice a day, one for K2, one for 3-5. That'll be on our um, YouTube channel. And if you click that link to the virtual story times, you don't have to do it now, Nikki, but that link will take you to that YouTube channel. Um, and then we're working on a virtual ed camp. And then Nikki kind of talked about this, but I'm also in the process of, and will be producing some, I think I'm gonna call them bite-sized PD um, things, mostly for learning media that will show you, um, you know, how to log in and how to use the different features of learning media. So that's what we have in the works at Idaho Public Television. You can go to the next slide now. <laughs> do you want to do this one or do you want me to? Uh, yeah, you, you can talk about that one, sure. I mean, we basically already chatted about this, but we really wanted, Nikki and I, as we were talking and, and planning this webinar, and when, you know, 400 people signed up for it, we really thought, okay, there's obviously interest. We wanted to make ourselves available um, for if you have questions or specific things you want to drop in and, and ask. And so um, we're going to, I think we've talked about weekly, right, Nikki? Um, we could possibly do more if there's so much demand that people are popping in. But what we're going to do is starting Monday um, at one o'clock mountain time, mountain daylight time, um, we will just have a Zoom open, which we will send that link out um, for everybody in a follow up email after this. But we'll just open up a Zoom. Nikki and I and a, a colleague of ours, like I said, that teaches um, taught high school for like 20 years. Um, will be on that and we'll just be there for from one to two or I mean I can stay longer if we need to so from one to two you're welcome to just pop in say hey I have questions about this can you show me how to use something or ask questions and um and we're happy to to coach you through this um difficult you know and exciting learning opportunity so yeah and I, I think that in concludes our webinar. We've got uh, some contact information for Carrie and Paige and I, and we'll get um, Sarah's and Tracy's added to that slide as well. Um, we did record this webinar, and so after um, it gets processed and, and ready to share, we'll put it up on YouTube and then share the link with anybody who's interested. Um, and then we would highly recommend getting in, in touch with us if we can answer your specific questions. Um, the survey we put out gave us a whole lot of ideas about webinars we could host in the future. This was really meant to be an introductory overview. Um, so we keep a lookout for um, other events that we hope to be having soon. We'll stay on for a little bit and answer any questions, you might want to pop into the chat box. Um, but thank you for joining us today and um, enjoy your weekend. It's Friday. Yay. Idaho has a teacher Facebook page as well. So Google that and follow it. I'm posting stuff there too. So we'll stick around if people have questions. <laughs>